Well, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be with you. This is Pastor Corey, and I'm here with uh, my mentor and friend, a wonderful leader, Dr. Charles Revis. He's the, the, the executive minister of Mission Northwest, which is a great ministry that blesses and supports and encourages our church and also churches around the Northwest region and beyond. And he, so they're a, a partner with us in mission, and we're blessed to be able to support them a bit. And, but they really provide uh, support and encouragement and leadership training for a number of churches. And so it's great to have Charles with us. He comes down and worships with us when he can and stays connected with myself and Tim. And, and so, hi, Charles. How are you today? Hi, Corey. Doing great. Yep. Yeah. 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 You've got a beautiful picture there. Uh, yeah, it's not the way it looks outside today. It was snowy, <laughs> but uh, I just thought I'd show a little bit of wheat fields behind me. Well, and, that's uh, that fits right in for us. You bet. Yeah, our wheat fields are covered by snow today down here. So, but uh, yeah. we have that's a hopeful picture. So, thank you for sharing it with us. You bet. Golden, that's harvest time there. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's money in the bank or future money in the bank. <laughs> right. Um, so, so we're meeting together for soup suppers when this is going to be watched. And so I have a question for you that I think everybody wants to hear. Uh, what is your favorite soup? Does your family, uh, you and Karen have a favorite soup? Well, we have lots of soups that we enjoy and we have soup during the winter time, probably once a week. Uh, last night we had chili, but my favorite soup out of all the ones that we cook and actually Karen's the cook and I just stir when she tells me to stir, it's a tortellini, asparagus, pork combo soup, and it is really yummy. That's really my favorite one. But I like soup. I like food. So it's hardly that sounds, I don't like to eat. That sounds delicious. And if we ever do have these soup suppers again in person, which hopefully next year, uh, maybe we'll invite you down and you have to bring that. Uh, you, yeah. you probably haven't got to go to one of our soup suppers, but sometimes we have seven or eight soups lined up and we got some uh, gourmet soup makers. So you, you sound like you would fit right in. I would. Uh, I, I would like that. <laughs> or, or Karen would fit right in and you there would you enjoy go. the soup. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thanks again for being with us. As, as I was sharing with you earlier, our theme for this Lent is more God. And we're, we're just asking people to share um, when a time when God became more in your life. And, yeah. um, you know, I yeah. So can you tell us a, about a time when, when God just really became more to you personally? Yeah. But, you know, when you asked me to interview today, and asked me to respond to that question. It's interesting how in my head, I went back through my life to different points in my life where I felt like I had drawn closer to God or God had cl drawn closer to me. And out of that, a feeling that I had more of God or more of an experience of who he is and what he's about. And boy, it's really kind of hard to choose just one kind of point. Yeah. One observation I made, and then I'll get to a uh, a specific story. It seems that so often in transition periods in our lives, those are great opportunities to allow God to be more in our lives, is, is the mm -hmm. way I would put it. I mean, he's always there for us. He's always present. I believe he's always wooing us. And we're the ones that tend to put him off or ignore him or go about our business. And yeah, uh, uh, you mean like transition, like, uh, like, uh, Big life transition points, like yeah, yeah. I'd say, yeah, that. I'd say big life transitions, whether obviously you know marriage, uh, the birth of a of a child, times that you move to another location, perhaps a vocation change, those kind of things. And I, and grandchildren, I grandchildren, absolutely, amen to that. <laughs> in fact, we have our fifth grandchild coming in five weeks. Ooh. So wow. we're looking forward to that. And that's yet one more transition. Uh, and, and so I, I think all the way back to when I was 19, fresh out of high school, uh, I was uh, got exposed to people that were really excited about Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, in the Jesus movement in the Washington, D.C. area. And so I started hanging out with a whole bunch of people that were 18 to about 24 that I would, we would call Jesus freaks today. And so mm -hmm. we met for worship every Saturday night 
in the basement of Truro Episcopal Church in Fairfax, Virginia. And it was church way out of the box, especially considering I was a Baptist kid, uh, raised in a Baptist home. My dad's a Baptist pastor, was a Baptist pastor, retired. Um, and so I started hanging out with these folks. And uh, think about this, this uh, worship was done on guitars. Everybody's standing, lots of raising of hands, uh, lots of giving praise to Jesus during that time and excitement about the teaching that would come. Yeah. That's way outside the box for that time frame, right? It, exactly right. Yeah. This is like, yeah. like I said, 1970, uh, a long time before we even got into the uh, transition towards more contemporary worship. So that was mm -hmm. our version of modern worship. And it was way out of the box back then. But for me, uh, at that point in my life, I, that was the summer of my, after my freshman year in college, uh, kind of moving in those circles. And I just felt that my whole world was opened up to more of who God was and mm -hmm. what he was about and what he was doing. And, and just being exposed to a lot of people whose lives are radically transformed through the power of really uh, being born again, uh, giving their mm -hmm. lives to Christ and being radically uh, born again. But fast forward uh, uh, many, many years later as a pastor, uh, and I think some of you would relate to this. I, I went through a really hard time in my pastorate about three years before I transitioned to come up here. And it really, to be re very honest, it revolved around some of the, the downside of my personality, being kind of a driver, uh, A-type, mm. uh, high expectations. And there were some folks that had gotten sideways with me and mm -hmm. did not really like my style. And so uh, we had a little church coup. It wasn't really little. It was about 35 people decided Whoa. that it was time for me to leave. And this is a church in those days that ran, we ran about 275 in worship, almost 300. So it was a significant group of people. And so there was a lot of issues that revolved around that. And I remember uh, in the midst of that, the, the, the pain of it, uh, having to own my stuff, uh, the parts of it that were unfair and trying to sort through that, uh, going through what I call the dark night of the soul of really, Lord, where are you in this? Uh, do you still love me? Do you still want me to be a pastor mm -hmm. of this church? Should I uh, hang tough here or not? And so there's that season of just kind of opening my life before the Lord and just praying to do the right thing in it. And, and what I think I discovered was part of having more of God in your life is being willing to own up to your stuff, including the, the, the frailties that we have, the weaknesses we have, the, the places where we mess up. There's parts of our personality that for every strength we have, there tends to be a weakness that goes along with that, uh, kind of the dark side, so to speak, mm -hmm. just owning up to it and that God is gr strong enough and great enough that we just put that out before him and others, that is, other Jesus followers and say, hey, forgive me. Uh, this is an area of weakness in my life. I need to improve mm -hmm. here. And that is really hard for us to do. And especially as a pastor, we're supposed to be perfect, right, Corey? I mean, you're perfect, but most Yeah, pastors, yeah, you know. Charles, I was hoping you wouldn't let the congregation <laughs> know. That... Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, look, try, to try to make the story shorter, eventually what happened was those folks uh, decided to leave, and it was okay, and we chose to bless them, and the church uh, became unified again, and we kept moving ahead with good ministry. And then uh, when I was called to come here, up here uh, 17 and a half years ago, thereabouts, I felt like I really had grown through that time to be more equipped to be a pastor to pastors, to be someone that understands how difficult it can be at times to mm -hmm. pastor as a broken, wounded shepherd, so to speak. Uh, there's one yeah. great perfect shepherd and that's jesus and he's the one we follow and yet we've been asked to lead we've been asked to pastor churches and we do so in our weakness and 
and in his in his strength. And uh, that's why we we need all the help he can give us. And we would be wise as pastors, as regular church folks that are say linking arms together to do ministry in a community uh, to to invite as much of the living God into our lives as possible. And, and that's a struggle for us every day. I know it yeah. is with me. It's just to open up our lives that way to him. Yeah. It, it uh, and in case you're hearing a noise, I, I just <laughs> should let you know uh, a snow plow came and is plowing oh. our, our park. So, uh, yeah. which I'm not going to stop because we, you know, we got a parking lot covered with snow. And right. uh, but I want you to know if you heard a scraping noise, um, you know, I wasn't grinding my teeth or anything. Um, <laughs> so, but is it C.S. Lewis? It's somebody that says that it's God whispers to us in our blessings, but screams to us through our pain or something like that. That, yeah, I, in listening to your story, there's certain things in our life where. It seems like we are only open up to God's greatness or his help if he exposes weakness or because uh, yeah. we're just taking care of it on our own. And then, right. you know, a challenge happens and we have to really go, oh, this is bigger than me. This is bigger than That's what I know right. how to handle. And I should have been leaning on God. Um, um, and I guess there's some lessons we can only learn that way. I, yeah, I think um, so. Yeah. The God shouts to us in our pain or times of pain. Otherwise, we get on autopilot going about our lives, and <clears throat> next thing you know, we've not paid all that much attention to our walk uh, with the Lord. And that's why to have more of God means that we have to give attention to Him and uh, keep that relationship going because He's there. He's not moving yeah. away from us. He promises yeah. never yeah. to leave us, forsake us. But there are two scriptures that come to mind that I think I told you I wanted to share as part of this. Yeah. Uh, first is James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Mm. And similar to that is Hebrews 10, 22, that says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. And in my life, I find that I just need to stop whatever it is I'm doing, listening to music or reading a book or watching something on my iPad and just spend some time talking to them. And mm. it can be just as simple as in my car, say, or in my truck driving up to go skiing. But instead of listening to a book on my uh, phone or iPod, I just spend that time talking to him and conversing about my life. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like if I draw near to him that way, he's drawing nearer to me. And I, I, so I would just encourage folks to think about that's one way to have more God in your life is to have more time of talking to him, uh, praying, uh, spending those quiet moments with him. And those could be peppered throughout the day uh, for people that are morning pe persons. That's a great time to do it. Uh, others in the evening. Uh, I, I, but I think there's something to be said about just keeping that discussion going, that dialogue going. Yeah. with the lord throughout the day yeah 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 that's awesome charles i tell people sometimes when you get in your car you know i, I don't know how many people still use the standard radio but uh when i started this illustration a lot of people did it instead of turning that on you know turn it off and in your mind tell yourself i'm i'm turning on my my soul to listen to you god and and i think i'm so inclined to just easily turn on the audio book or the podcast and and sometimes I just need to, more often than I do, just focus, listen, yeah. and keep that conversation going. That's good. Me That's too. good. I, I, um, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I, some people don't know about you. I know there's many in our church family who do because we've prayed for you in your journey, but you're what could be called a walking quadriplegic. I don't know if that's the right term. You've had a spinal cord injury uh, yeah. that's impacted you uh, physically, and a lot of people maybe can't tell from outside looking at you, but you obviously can tell by how it's uh, impacted your life. And, and I don't know if you wanted to talk about that journey. I, that's a huge topic, but yeah, it is but, a huge topic. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that uh, I know you've leaned on God throughout uh, that journey, uh, that God that really became more real to you way back in 1970. Um, I guess is the same God that knew and I don't know how we deal with these things theologically, but knew that, that 
your story already. Um, any anything? Uh, I don't know. I'm not forming a good question there, but what what can well, you teach us about God being more through what let, you've lived through? Let, let me put it this way. Uh, yeah, I had a an accident that turned my life upside down, and I've done a lot of pretty edgy sports through the years. Uh, the number one was windsurfing out in the ocean and down the Columbia River Gorge in extreme conditions and a lot of skiing, a lot of mountain biking, never broken a leg, never had a stitch, never cut myself. And then all, all of a sudden, 10 years ago, ended up with a spinal cord injury in my neck between C3 and four, C4, almost broke my neck, but still ended up with a spinal cord injury that left me totally paralyzed. And the after effect of that is I live with uh, neurological pain throughout my body from my neck down and weakness in my limbs. Uh, my right leg's about a third to a half numb and sometimes doesn't move like I'd like. And I get stiff and things like spasticity. And I do, you know, I ski, I, I was, you know, I'm able to ski again and get out on a bike and do those kind of things. But I do them now with pain and weakness and it's not been much fun. And there've been a lot of times I've been frankly, upset about that, uh, hard to come to terms with it. And some days I don't have a good attitude about it. Uh, but the, the one, one thing I would wanna say to anybody in the middle of pain, especially chronic pain or disappointment over an accident that maybe left you with ongoing struggles physically, is that that says nothing about the love of God towards us in Jesus mm. Christ. Absolutely nothing. I, I don't believe that God smacked me down and gave me a spinal mm -hmm. cord injury. I believe I was at, I just took a bad fall and had uh, ended up with it. Um, and it says nothing whatsoever about who my God is. And uh, I've come to believe more than ever that our Lord identifies with our pain and suffering. And he's made that very clear to us by going to the cross and dying for us and suffered uh, to the depth that he did. And I can look to the cross and look to the love of Jesus and know that in him, uh, he understands my suffering. He has felt my suffering and feels it now. And I can continue to look forward to that day because of looking back to the cross, there's a day coming when I will be fully healed. It probably won't be in this lifetime, uh, it'll be on the other side in the resurrection when I'm made whole. And mm -hmm. I am looking forward to that day <laughs> when there's no more pain and there's no more suffering uh, when we're made whole in Jesus. And we can look forward to that and hold on to that hope. And that is a faith walk. So, you know, I, I don't want to give the idea that to mm -hmm. say you have more of God means all of a sudden you have more feelings happening right. in your body. Or, or you're getting flashes of revelation. It's not that as much as I think a, a deeper sense that he is who he says he is. And he means business when he says, I love you. And I love you so much. I'm taking your place at the cross in death. And you can put your hope in me and not be disappointed uh, because that day is coming when I will raise you to new life in me. So that's, that's one of the things I've learned out of it. There's a lot of other things. So I better, you know, you know, preachers yeah. be careful and say, okay, enough, enough. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, thank you, Charles. And thank you for being willing to be interviewed for our, our Soup Supper series and just sharing uh, how God has become more in your life. Uh, you're a blessing to many. And, and thank you for sharing that wonderful background too. That gives us hope. <laughs> 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 hey, if you have that soup soon, can you send me a picture uh, and I'll forward it to our congregation. All right. Okay. We can, uh, yeah. we, it would help us practice do not covet. You know, we would just <laughs> try to be thankful. And, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Charles. Uh, I hope you have a, a great day and we'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks, Pastor Corey. See ya. <laughs>